Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Michael McDonald and I'm going to take some time today to talk to you about something that's uh, really a big passion of mine and that's designing great games for the Windows Store. So let's go ahead and get started and uh, have a little chat about what makes designing games for the Windows Store so amazing. Windows 8 has reach. Um, the one amazing thing about developing games for the Windows Store is you have the, the uh, advantage of being able to target a lot of different um, technologies and platforms all at once. Um, we have tablets that have touch and sensors built into them. Uh, we have laptops with high resolution screens, um, PCs with amazing power. And we can really leverage all this to design some really amazing user experiences in our games. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to um, go through each one of them, highlight some of the key points, and um, kind of give you a feeling of how you can leverage this to help improve your user's experience overall. Okay, some key features um, in Windows 8 are, well, first of all, the one thing that everyone's going to notice right off the top is the live tiles. Uh, live tiles can really help engage your audience and keep your users informed without actually having to launch the game. So um, one thing that you can do is you can um, put scores up there, you can put achievements, you can put challenges, you can even put invitations from other players. So it's um, a really good way to drive the user experience without the user actually being inside the game. Um, make sure you make this really you know, bright and colorful, draw the eyes into it. Uh, so that's one, one major thing you'll notice right off the bat. Uh, another thing that I really like is the share and device contracts. Um, with the share and device contracts, it really helps open up your game and um, app to, to the web and other devices that are on, already on the, um, the Windows 8 platform. So you could do things like share um, with Facebook, share with Twitter. Um, it, it's a really neat feature and we'll go into a little more depth about that after. Um, we also have support for, for different input methods. Um, you can use touch, you can use pen, you can use keyboards, mouse, and of course gamepads. So we'll talk a little bit about um, how to use all these different input methods and, and, and how to leverage them for your game. Um, sensors. Oh, this is really exciting. Um, you've got things like light sensors, gyroscopes, accelerometers, you've got location devices like GPS. So we can really use all this to expand the experience of the game and um, allow a lot of the users to really do things that they wouldn't expect in most games, right? Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about that too. Um, form factors and views. Okay, so this is great. You've got tablets to large LCDs, right? So you have very, uh, a very variety um, of tablets uh, that have different screen resolutions and sizes. Um, you've got LCDs that are just absolutely huge with, you know, um, beyond HD now. So that's something that we really need to take into consideration when we're designing our game is what, what do we expect the player to be playing this on and kind of build into it so that they have the ability to switch from different form factors and views. Uh, one other thing that's coming out and becoming a little more popular now is the game controllers with screens on them or tablets being used as uh, a secondary screen or a different view for the video game. So that's something that's really nice uh, to play around with and, and, and possibly leverage in your game. And then of course there's uh, the Windows Store. This is like the developer's best friend. Um, it gives us great opportunities. Um, it, it really lets us get out there and distribute, promote, and, um, and get our games out into the marketplace. It's, it's built so that you can get feedback from, the, uh, from your audience and, and um, you know, little things like making in-purchase, um, in-game app purchases. Like, it makes it so much easier to do that with the Windows Store. Uh, we'll go into a little more depth about that in a bit, but it's, it's a really nice feature that uh, I've used personally in a couple of my games is the, uh, the limited free trials feature. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, the big thing is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through all this and really show you how we can uh, use these features and how they affect and, and the design and development of our game as we get started. Okay, our best ad statement. Um, this is basically, uh, can be summed up as, what makes your game stand out from the rest? What can you do better that, than any other game? What makes your game unique? 
So um, a best ad statement for a game like um, Cannonball would be um, Cannonball is uh, best at providing users with a simple and exciting game that allows them to create music um, by guiding a ball through platforms and collecting coins. Um, it's really important that you do this before you start designing your game. Sit down and think to yourself, what is my game going to be best at? You know, and, and that's really going to drive your development as you move forward. It's going to help you make um, decisions uh, about your strategy moving forward. Uh, things like, do I need tilt? Do I need touch? Um, does it use a camera? All these things um, can really be answered with your best at statement. You know, am I going to be best at uh, tilt controls for a marble maze game? Something along those lines. So it's it's really important to take a look at this and sit down and think it through before you get started. Okay, live tiles, secondary tiles, and notifications. So we talked about this a little bit um, in, the, in a previous slide there, was uh, about the live tiles and, and really how they draw the player's eye in. Um, it's really important that you have your branding there as well. Um, make it fit your game, uh, make it bubbly, make it bright. You really, this is your gateway to your game. You want this to be what stands out immediately. So if you take a look at the image I've got there on screen, um, you'll see that there's a high score uh, being presented for the cannonball as well as the uh, current treasure limit. So they're giving the users information about the game before the game's even launched. Um, this is really useful for games that have multiplayer for instance. You could use the live tile to um, display notifications um, about someone's turn. Like So if it's a turn based game and it's my turn, it's going to pop up and say it's your turn, right? And you can go ahead and click in there and play the game through. Um, other things like uh, high scores, for instance, if uh, my best friend beats my high score, I want to know. So a good place to put that would be your live title. It'll pop up and say, you know, your, your latest high score has just been beaten. Um, and it's a nice way to keep the users engaged um, without having to constantly launch the game to see, you know, where am I in the standings or what achievements ha uh, do I have left or have I gotten yet. So you can really use this to your advantage. Um, in this case, they're using the wide tile. Um, there's also the, the smaller tiles. So you can see whatever fits best. Um, make sure you plan for both um, and, and make that available to the user because a lot of times people will zoom them and shrink them to whatever fits best on their screen. Okay. Splash screens and progress controls. Now this is very important. Uh, this is the first thing that a player is going to see when they launch your game. Um, you want to make sure it's branded. Uh, it shows off maybe some highlights of the game, some, some uh, animation, or the characters. So in this case, uh, on the screen we have uh, Skulls of the Shokens as uh, one of our templates, and then of course uh, the Pirates Love Daisies loading screen. So what you'll notice about these is they're very bright, um, they're branded very well, uh, there's not too much going on. Um, but in the case of the Pirates Love Daisy screen, it's showing you that you you know that it's still working on something. It says loading. So that's very important. If your game's going to take more than, say, three seconds to load up, make sure you provide the user with a progress bar. Um, so, it, you know, it shows them that the game's not locked up. This is also very important uh, when switching from uh, a cutscene, say, to... Um, or levels. If it's going to take more than, say, half a second to load the cutscene or load the next level, make sure you provide the user some sort of feedback so they know that the app hasn't crashed. The last thing you want is some user exiting your game because they think it, it's crashed when all it's doing is loading. So that's definitely something to keep in mind and uh, is definitely a best practice in my opinion. So layout navigation. <clears throat> layout navigation is very, very important to games. Um, you don't want to have your users spending a lot of time scrolling through um, menu systems, you know, digging through complex and um, unwieldy uh, systems to find out where they need to go immediately. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so one thing you'll notice about um, this one here, uh, Skull of the Sh uh, Shogun, is very simplistic, but everything is right there for you to see. So 
even if it's rich and complex or it's basic and simple, you want to make sure that it's really easy for the user to navigate. Don't um, bury options and bury uh, achievement screens and stuff like that and make them click through multiple things. Uh, they're, they're not going to enjoy the experience and it's going to detract from, from your overall game. Um, a lot of options are used in the navigation, so like you might want to put your options in there, you might want to have an achievement screen, maybe a low, uh, leaderboard, multiplayer lobbies. <clears throat> in some cases, um, I've seen games not even use a menu screen and just launch right into the game. It really depends on what you're doing. So when you design, when you start your design process, really sit down and think, how much information do I need to present to the, the user right away? Um, what, what are the types of things that they're going to want to do immediately when they get into the game? That's important because you, you want that to be the first experience that they have. Um, you don't want them to come in and, and you know, have to click through seven different things just to launch the game. So um, we'll go into detail a little bit about that and I'll actually demo uh, Skulls of the Show, uh, Shogun so you can see how their menu system works. And this actually brings up a good point. This is um, basically when you start designing, you want to think about what pattern fits my game best. Um, and, and when it comes to menu design and that, you want to think um, what kind of system do I want to use for my particular uh, situation. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and um, we'll take a look at a couple here. Um, two of the major ones are um, hierarchical uh, pattern and flat pattern. So we're going to go into each one um, independently. Let's take a look at the hierarchical pat pattern first. Sorry. <clears throat> um, this pattern is really good for showing everything up front. It puts all the content in front of the users immediately. So your users feel like they're getting the complete experience at once. Um, you can have sections for, say, um, level choosing, new games, uh, continuing old ones. Uh, you can have uh, sections for showing achievements and friend activity. And you can do all this by putting it all on one horizontal panning uh, screen. So this is really good um, for games that uh, have a lot of different options or a lot of secondary experiences. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you could do with this pattern is you could actually brand each one of the sections. So say I click on uh, a level. Uh, you could actually have it branding, like changing the background to match that level. So the user gets that kind of uh, um, feeling like it's specialized to each section, right? Um, th that's important. It kind of draws the player in. It gives them a, a little bit more uh, feeling of completeness. Uh, one thing about this design is depending on your game, of course, but you might always want to include something like a back button uh, that will bring you right back to this hub. So if I'm in the middle of playing the game, um, I can click on this back button and it'll take me right back to the hub. Uh, maybe I can check my achievements or something like that. It's uh, a really good idea to include that uh, with this design. Now, the one thing that this um, the hierarchical design really um, works well with is a thing called um, semantic zoom. So, um, because you have a lot of choices when it comes to that pattern, you you have a lot of scrolling issues. Like you're going to be um, scrolling from side to side uh, to to see other categories. So, what semantic zoom does is it allows you to zoom out and see all the categories at once. This makes it a lot faster for you to navigate through your system and makes it easier for the players to find what they're looking for. So you could pinch out and zoom out. Um, in this case on the screen, you could see that it has game themes, awards, leaderboards, that. And then I could go right in and say uh, select achievements. And I can zoom right in on those achievements. Um, so it's one easier way of, of letting them navigate so they're not constantly scrolling from side to side trying to find what they're looking for. So that's it's definitely a, a, something that you want to include when you're using that pattern. Okay, the other pattern that's really popular is called the flat pattern. Um, the flat pattern keeps the gameplay front and center. 
it it's great for branding your game um, because you're seeing all that right in front of you. It it's minimalistic, but it can be rich with information. So uh, as you're seeing right here in the game uh, Tankster, you have um, everything up on screen at once. You can see the interaction with the game, and you have like you know your invitations to match or to a match, or in this case, you know, it's pointing out that you have your, your turns available in one of the matches. So you can get a lot of information across the player, but it's not, you know, it's not like the, the it's not all over the place. It's not in a list. It's not, you, there's no scrolling involved. It, it's, it's really good for um, putting all the content functionality up front. So uh, one of the other things that I really like about it is you can kind of funnel your players through settings as well, right? Um, you know, join match and then it'll go to another screen that'll allow you to pick uh, different settings for that match. So you're basically having the player funnel through the steps that they need to start the game without feeling like they have to go clicking through a bunch of menus. Um, this can be great for games that don't have other standalone experiences. Um, it's, it, it's really good for the games that are more or less about that particular interaction. It's not about, you know, um, uh, connecting with friends or, or um, you know, uh, having side uh, side games and stuff like that in it. <clears throat> uh, one thing to point out though about um, uh, app layout considerations is you want to maintain a single scrolling direction. Don't mix and match uh, hor horizontal and vertical views. Um, for example, a uh, top score list. Uh, that would be displayed vertical. So you'll be scrolling from top to down a lot in that. So one way you can take that out of the equation is um, wrap it, set it as columns. So you have one list and then the next. Um, that way the player's not scrolling constantly. And if you feel like there is too much scrolling, uh, one good way of um, getting around that is, again, using semantic zoom. So if you go through it and you're like, you know what, I'm scrolling too much to see the high score table. Why not give it a semantic zoom, let people pinch out, uh, or pinch it and, and see all of the all of it at once in, a, in more of a zoomed form. So those are the two patterns. Um, I want to take some time now and actually show you these patterns in use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up um, a couple of games here. First, I'm going to uh, fire up um, uh, Skulls of the Shogun and show you how they implemented their menu system and uh, their loading screen and whatnot. So the first thing I want to show you here, actually, is the live tiles. Um, if you look here, you'll see um, for Jetpack Joyride, um, it's giving me information. It says here, you know, you've collected five vehicles. It's constantly rotating and updating and letting me see information about the game before I even load it. So it's kind of nice. And there you've got Cut the Rope. It's saying that I have six stars so far. Um, so it's always giving you a little bit of feedback and, and keeping you interested without actually loading the game. So let's go ahead and fire up uh, Skull of the Shogun here. They have their splash screens here. Of course, branded with all the, the companies that worked with it. And then here we get into the menu. It's This is kind of like a hierarchical uh, pattern mixed with a flat pattern. You have your, your um, sections, um, but they're laid out in such a way that all the information is readily acceptable. You don't have to scroll or anything, it's just right there. So, for instance, if I wanted to check my achievements, I can click my achievements here. It should look up, there we go. And it loads up um, another screen that shows me all my achievements. Uh, currently I don't have any, so uh, I guess I better get on that and get some achievements. Um, but yeah, it, it makes it easy for your, um, your players to find what they're looking for. If you can see here, I can, I can scroll through, like starting a new campaign, um, when I click it, it takes me to a new screen and it brands it with a little bit different feel. So it kind of customizes it to the new game experience. So your users are getting kind of a feedback and it gives a nicer experience to the user. So that's basically Skulls of the Shogun's, um, the way they handle their menu system. So let's go ahead and take a look at another game here. Um, let's take a look at Jetpack Joyride. As you can see, they have a loading screen there, smashing high scores, it says. It just gives the user uh, feedback, letting them know that your game is loading, and it's not crashed, it's, it, it's coming. <laughs> it's always nice to, to let the player know that you're, 
you're not, you know, crashing or or stalled or, or something along those lines. Um, so with Jetpack Joyride, they've went with more of the flat design again. Um, here you can see it says touch anywhere to play. So I can immediately jump right into this game if I wanted to. I can just click the screen and away I go. I can start playing immediately. Um, but if I want to check out other things, they have the list on the side. So uh, if I want to check what missions are available to me, I can go ahead and click that. And it says your mission so far, and it pops out a little thing here. All the while keeping interaction going, you see the little guys moving around. It, it keeps you feeling like the game's running and you're doing something. So again, it's kind of like a loading screen only through the menu systems, right? So then if I click leaderboards, it'll go out and it'll download the leaderboards. So as you can see, there's multiple ways to handle the menu system. It, again, it really depends on what your game's trying to achieve and what kind of features are included in your game. So try to keep that in mind when you're developing exactly what is my game's uh, key features and uh, what can I use to, uh, to make it easier and more fluid for the, for the average user to navigate. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about gameplay interactions. <laughs> What's a game with no input, right? So um, let's talk about a little bit about what Windows 8 has to offer in, in terms of uh, interactions with the player and input. Uh, some of the, the major um, points are touch interactions. Um, Windows 8 supports multi-touch interactions, which means you can have up to five inputs on the screen at once. So you could do something like you know pan and zoom while shooting or controlling the player and camera. Uh, this opens up a lot of possibilities to the game developers and allows us to do things like virtual um, game pads on the screen. Um, with five inputs, you're, you're not really limited to what you can creatively do. Uh, so you could do things like invisible controls, like a, a D-pad or, or joystick. Um, not only does this add a, a nice layer of interaction, but it also cuts down on screen clutter. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you want to do, though, when you do do an invisible control is let the size be customizable. Um, make it relative to, or make it relative to where it shows up for the player. So say I put my thumb down, have that where the joystick will show up, or at least let me customize it. You're never going to have a one size fits all solution. Um, everybody's got different size hands, different size thumbs. So you want to make sure that you're allowing the, the user um, some flexibility when it comes to the inputs. Um, another big thing to watch out for is the default, default placement. Watch where you're holding the device. Um, if you get too close to the screen edges, you're going to run into things where you're doing um, un unintentional swipe commands. So I could be trying to move my player and move my thumb a little awkwardly, and if I'm too close to the edge, uh, it might think that I'm trying to do a swipe command. So that's something that you really want to watch out for when you're, um, when you're developing your touch inputs. Okay, multi-input modes. Um, when designing games, you should really try to target touch as well as keyboard um, and mouse and pen. Uh, wherever possible, try to support all of these input methods. Um, your control screen should be very fluid and consistent as possible. Um, if you're doing input switching, try to do it dynamically in real time so that the player is not not experiencing some sort of lag in controls or stop in, uh, stopping in the game and stuff like that. Um, one thing, don't add settings to allow the players to turn on and off controls. Um, if they want to use a mouse, let them use the mouse. If they want to use the touch, let them use the touch. But they should be able to decide on the fly and not have to go into the settings and change things, right? Um, ideally, your game should support all control modes seamlessly and equally without really having to switch modes. Okay, so app bar commands. Um, app bar commands are f basically used to na for navigation and stuff. So try to design your game so the players basically everything they need to do immediately should be on the canvas. Um, if there's additional commands that need to be used by the user every once in a while, they're going to ex expect them to actually be in the app bar. It's um, a philosophy and design principle of Windows 8, so your users are already going to understand that if they're looking for something that's not on the canvas, chances are it's going to be in the app bar. So, you know, that's one thing to, ver to think about. 
Um, another thing to think about is contextual commands. So, if you're using a, um, a commands like this, have it depend on you know the user's location in the hub, or depending on what they've selected within the hub. Um, for things like selections, go to the left um, of the of the app bar. Um, you know, so if you've got other things, you uh, how can I put this better? Um, if you have contextual commands, try to keep them to the left because that's basically the design principle in Windows 8. If it's something that you're doing specifically in that screen, chances are all the information you're going to need and commands you're going to need are going to be on the left side of your screen. Um, anything that has like that are always there, like say starting a new game or maybe pausing the game, that should go on the right side of the app bar. Um, it, it's basically the design principles, and it's what your users are going to expect when they're playing your game. So you definitely want to stick with that. Um, when we're talking about the app bar, there's one question you should really ask yourself. Well, actually, two questions you should really ask yourself. Um, will this control be used frequently? And is this control crucial to the gameplay? If you answer either answer yes to either of those questions, it may be a good choice to put that specific control on the canvas. Um, this ensures the users won't become like frustrated with constantly having to go down to the app bar and bring up something that is being used over and over and over again. So the app bar should be for things that are very infrequent and, and not necessary um, to continue the game. Um, also with the app, star, uh, app control bars, you can personalize them and add uh, some personality or branding to them. So there's a little bit of flexibility there as well. So I'm going to show you um, real quick. I'm going to demo uh, a game called Cut the Rope. Um, I personally like the way they use their menu system. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Cut the Rope here. Now with Cut the Rope here, you'll see um, immediately it signs me in. But they're, they've done a really good job of putting what's useful right on the screen. So for instance, options is right there. Um, your ability to turn on and off the sound is right there. Uh, they've kept, kept it very minimalistic, but it's, it's very good for, um, for showing exactly how simple a menu can be, but getting all the information to the player at once. Uh, the other thing that's really good about Cut the Rope is their input system. Um, they have done a great job at touch, uh, touch input. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the game here and show you what I mean. So this is all, this is the entire um, menu system uh, in the game. As you can see, I've got my stars up here that let me know how many I've collected. We've got something that tells me, you know, that lets me uh, mute the sound. Um, and then we have our restart button and our menu button. So they've put everything that you're going to need right on the canvas. But they've done it in such a way where there's not a lot of clutter. So this is a really good example of if you need to put everything on the canvas, how can I do that without overwhelming the player? And uh, of course, the, the touch inputs on this game are fantastic. It's very fluid, and um, again, I'm using the mouse. Um, on a tablet, you could use your your um, your finger to swipe and cut. I didn't really do that at that time. <laughs> you can uh, you can really see where the um, the advantage of touch uh, comes into a game like like uh, cut the rope. So that's a really good example to take a look at if you're you're trying to decide um, how to use interactions with a player. Let's talk about a little bit about sensors. Um, sensors are, are, are really fun for me personally. I like the, uh, the ability to add a layer of dynamics to my game that I can't necessarily do on, say, just a PC platform or, you know, maybe some of the game consoles. So, um, it really opens up a new world of interaction to us. We have things like the accelerometers, we have the compass, we have the gyro, light sensors, and a bunch of other things. So um, some of the examples you could do is like, so say for an accelerometer, you could use it to like steer a car or tilt elements on your game. I'm sure a lot of you have played uh, games out there that like, you know, racing games that allow you to tilt your, your phone or your tablet to control the player's movements. Um, that can be a really uh, nice layer of interaction. Um, you've got things, uh, you could use this, the device's um, uh, location sensors to determine you know, how to rotate or turn your player or camera viewpoint. So if I move the device, the camera's, you know, turns a little bit. 
Um, you can shake the device and get input that way. You know, uh, maybe that's how you defeat an enemy or reset a game board in a puzzle game or something along those lines. Um, light sensors um, are great for changing like a mood or lighting of a game's uh, rendering. So um, you can kind of get a feel of like if they're in a bright room, you could you know darken up the images a little bit, or if they're in a dark room, you could do you know some really big flashes of light and stuff to kind of like, you know, if you're doing a horror game, maybe to scare them or something. So it's uh, it's really cool uh, in that respect. Um, augmented reality is possible with these sensors. So you could, you know, do things like um, have a game where you're actually playing in your environment and have secret elements hidden right in the world. So that's that's really fun. Uh, so with things like sensor, sensor fusion that's built into Windows 8, it enables you uh, precise orientation and location. So that is very important when you're doing AR and uh, can make a huge difference. And uh, you're, you're going to see a lot more AR uh, games coming out as, as the technology really develops. Um, yeah, so the possibilities are, flat, are vast. Uh, while not all center, uh, sensors make sense for your games, um, with a little creativity and thought, you can really come up with some clever ways to use them. Uh, simple gestures or movement can replace a lot of menu commands. So yeah, take a take a good look at how you can best fit these sensors into your game. Okay, let's talk a little bit about contracts. Um, Windows 8 uses contracts to really enrich the experience of your game. Um, it allows us to connect with other apps on the platform as well as the web and the world in general. So it's a really good way to enrich the experience of your game and add a, a really nice layer to uh, the user experience. So we'll talk a little bit about search. Um, search can be really good for games. Um, it's really interesting for games. It's one of those things where it may work for your game, it may not, right? So uh, one thing that I've used in the past for search is things like looking up friends statistics or standings, right? Or even trying to find a, a friend to play with. Uh, that can be a really good way to use search in your game. Um, uh, another thing is if you've got you know a lot of in-game um, items, you might be able to use search to really um, look through them all and find the the one that you're looking for instantly instead of scrolling through a bunch and you know and using maybe semantic zoom and that you could just search for it. So that's one way that you can really use search. Um, make sure you include the search in the charm, of course. Um, that's where users are going to go immediately. Um, and you'll see that they're they're generally going to start trying to search your game almost immediately uh, to find some things. So it's always good to include at least a little bit of search uh, functionality in your game. Now share. This is really good for gamers. Um, it allows us to connect to social media outlets and friends. Um, it allows you to post up, you know, some, something like a screenshot, even short clips of gameplay. Um, with Facebook, you know, you could share achievements or your game status. It's a really good way to get social interaction for your game. Um, and again, uh, players are gonna are gonna automatically look to the the, the share charm um, for some sort of functionality. So this could be really uh, a really good way to help promote your game um, as well as add some functionality to it. Um, uh, for example, uh, sending a, part a particular item in a role-playing game, for instance, uh, to a friend would be a really good way of using a share, right? So I could open up my share charm, I could type in, uh, you know, something like a, a hat or something, and I could share that with my player or with another player inside of a role-playing game. So that's one um, uh, simple way, to, you know, to, to include share inside of the game, not just including it with the social media aspect. So yeah, definitely use this to get your title out there. It's, it's a definitely a good way to do that. Okay, let's talk about devices. Okay, so the devices charms. Um, that's a really good place to, to put um, uh, features like uh, adding game pads or other peripherals that you might have for your game. Um, it allows the users, say, maybe to connect a larger screen. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting when it comes to games how you're going to use the devices, but there's definitely some, uh, some key points that you can look at to uh, really leverage the devices charms. Uh, one other thing that uh, users are going to use the device charms for is printing. 
you're going to see a lot of uh, um, users were going to, are going to go to um, that device charm, say to print out their high score table or something along those lines. So it's definitely uh, a good idea to include some functionality with that as well. Okay, settings and options. Um, all of your games settings and options, privacy policy, about, uh, even credits, um, help, everything like that should be accessible via the settings charm. Um, now I have shown you uh, some of the setting or some of the um, demos there and they they have separate um, uh, places to go to do your settings and options but it's always a good idea to have it built into the charm too. You don't want the user to go to your settings and options charm and nothing be in there. It's um, it's a Windows 8 design philosophy that everything be there for the settings and options. So it's almost like you'd want to go there, implement all that first, and then if you decide to maybe add a menu command where you can you know change your settings, that would be um, would be okay. But it would be an after the fact. You you definitely want to make sure that you're using the charms to the fullest because again, that's where players are going to go. They're going to automatically look to your charms. Um, for the information that they're used to finding in other apps and other games. Um, you might want to include something like a volume control in here too. Um, Windows 8 provides a global volume control, but uh, many games like to have their own more complex sound settings, you know, separating the music and sound effects and voices and stuff like that. Um, if you do do that, make sure you l include labels that make it clear that the audio settings are specific to your game and, and not necessarily um, uh, doing all of all of the uh, Windows 8 at once. So um, that's one thing you want to look out for. Make sure that you clearly label what your settings are doing and in what context your, your settings are working. Um, if your game includes something like uh, a gameplay training or help, uh, like a tutorial or something, uh, uh, this might be a good place to put um, uh, the information. Stick that in your settings term. Um, alternatively, you know, you could make the tutorials available part of your gameplay, which a lot of games are doing now. But it's always nice to be able to go to the settings terms and look up, you know, tutorials on how to use certain features of the game. So that that would be a good way of using the settings and options in, in that context. All right, let's talk about a little bit about player accounts. Um, player accounts are, are very useful for video game designers. Um, it's great for tracking players' progress through the game. Um, it's great for having them link into social networks. It's also very important for enabling revenue models. Um, by supporting player um, accounts, you're you're giving a more engaging experience to your player. Uh, that'll eventually, you know, that'll keep them coming back to to play. Um, they'll be able to, you know, keep track of their high scores and challenge their friends um, with these with this interaction. So it's definitely uh, a good strategy to have in any game, especially if you're going to be uh, doing in-app purchases. You definitely want to um, implement some sort of user sign-in and account management systems. <clears throat> so user sign-in, um, it's crucial to your game's experience that the user sign-in is dedicated up front. Like you want it to, to um, be immediately. Uh, you don't want it if they want to sign in, have them sign in immediately. If they don't want to sign in, don't have them make it so they can't play the game if they don't. Um, when it's possible, try to use the sign information from micro from a Microsoft account or from a cache sign in information from previous sessions in the game. Um, this is a good way to uh, have the player tie into their social media. So maybe they can sign in with Facebook or they can sign in with their you know their live account. Um, this is easy for them. They don't have to make another. Um, account just to play your game and it keeps everything kind of in one spot. Um, it's a really good idea when you're doing a user uh, sign-in to dedicate some space on the hub or on the screen to uh, to show them where to sign in. You saw there um, when I showed you cut the rope that right off the bat it showed up at the top says Scruffy Fern uh, signs in and it lets me know immediately that I've signed in or allows me to click there and sign out if I don't want to be signed in. So make sure that it's visible and easy for the players to find. You don't want them having to go to hunting around to uh, try to find out where they can sign in and where they can sign out. Uh, the setting panel comes into play here again too. It might be a good place to put uh, the user's sign in and sign in experience as well as account management would uh, be a great place to, uh, to uh, put that in your, in your settings term. Um, 
uh, your account management, you want to have it set up so that the player can, you know, say change their email address, change their passwords. Uh, you're going to want to do this all in the settings pane, uh, a pane rather. Um, any sign in experience they have should also be hosted in the settings site. So if I click in here, I should be able to, you know, update my info or just sign out. Um, make sure you're giving your players some sort of mechanism to adjust their, their settings basically um, when it comes to their account. Okay, so this, this brings us to uh, state management and the cloud. Um, state management is very important for games nowadays um, and with the cloud it makes that state management um, so much easier. It adds a, a level of continuity for your, uh, for your game across multiple platforms. Um, Saving the user's progress is important. You can do things like checkpoints and save files. Um, a lot of us are already used to that when we're designing games. You know, that's kind of like a, a given. You're going to want to have some point where they're going to save, uh, whether they reach a certain level or what it might be. But one thing that you're really going to want to think about is the state of the game. Um, if a game's suspended, um, you should pause that game, right? You, that game should... Um, transition to a state where it's not continuous, right? So that when I bring that game out of um, suspension mode, it should already be paused. Or at least have some sort of meaning, meaningful uh, feedback. If your game's not really a game that you can pause, it should allow you to, to know that you, you suspended and then have returned. <clears throat> um, if the app doesn't really have a pause menu, uh, one thing you could really do is uh, take them right back into the game. Um, immediately but if you do that you might want to include some sort of like countdown or a timer so they're not just being thrown right back into the action and it might catch them off guard and, and, and cause them to lose the game so that's one thing you want to take a look at it how you handle going to a, a, a pause state or um, a suspension state and how you return from that suspension state that's really important now with pausing not every game needs pausing um, Turn-based games, for example, there's really no need for pausing. Um, uh, you know, games driven entirely by a user, you know, without a clock or a timer, they don't really gain anything from having a pause feature. Um, so pausing the game when uh, they they navigate away from the game isn't completely necessary, but it, it's a good idea to at least give them some sort of sort of feedback on that. Um, <clears throat> If it's not possible, for instance, like uh, pausing in multiplayer game sessions, you don't really want the one player to be able to pause and hold up the rest of the game. So when you're building your game, you have to kind of take a look at it. Is pause going to make sense for what I'm doing? Um, is it a type of game where one player, if they pause, is going to hold up everyone? If that's the case, you might want to look at a different mechanism in ordering and for for allowing players to you know to take a break or a breather. Um, uh, one thing you could do is like register a loss of focus. Um, if the game, you know, if the game disappears, have a dial a dialog box pop pop up or something and say, you know, um, this game has been suspended. It's now returning. And again, that goes into like the whole countdown and stuff. So definitely take a look at you know when you're snapping, um, you're snap to and you're snap from. Uh, that's a good time to take a look at pausing. A lot of games um, because when you do the snap to, uh, it changes your your your. Um, your resolution and your uh, your format. It's a good idea if you don't have a, a mechanism in place to really um, allow the player to uh, to play the game while it's in snap view. Maybe just in, including a pause would be a, the best solution in that case. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the cloud now. Um, the cloud really allows um, users the chance to play their game in multiple places. So imagine that you have this situation where you're playing a game um, on your PC um, and you want to get up and say, go and play that at, you know, at the table with your tablet. This is where the cloud comes in um, and is really a great um, feature. You could save all your game states and settings right up into the cloud. So you get this um, this continuous experience across multiple uh, um, devices, whether it be a PC, a tablet. It doesn't matter where they are; they're going to experience that same 
um, experience, and they'll be able to pick up right where they left off, which is also a great a great feature. So when you're um, when you're building your game, think about how can I include the cloud uh, in my data situation. You know how can I make it so that the players um, have the ability to save all their information up into the cloud and be able to pull it down in a way that they can continuously um, continue their sorry continue their game no matter what device they are or, or where they left off from. So the cloud really opens up a great opportunity for us um, in multi-platform gaming. Okay, so this brings us to um, orientation and window size. Uh, orientation and window size is, is kind of a tricky situation. Um, a lot of times when you're developing games, you're, you're not sure of the resolutions that the player is going to be using and, and whatnot. So let's go through and, and, and really think about how we could use orientation and, and window size in our games. <clears throat> Um, in Windows 8, an app can have one of four visual states. It can have uh, a full screen landscape, it can have full screen portrait, it can have snapped, or it can have fill. Um, in order to get your game, um, in order to get your game uh, onto the store, you must uh, support at least full fill and snapped. Um, optionally, you can you know you can have portrait and landscape. Those are optional, but you must support full, fill, and snapped. Uh, be careful to maintain states when switching views. Like we were talking about before with the, uh, the pause state situation. If I'm going to um, transition from one state to the next, uh, whether it be you know, full screen landscape or full screen portrait, uh, snapped or fill, make sure that the user's experience is continuous. Um, so if I move the device into a portrait mode, um, it should scale and change the formatting, but I shouldn't lose my point in the game. Um, that's a, a big key. You don't want to, you know, uh, ru ruin the uh, the user's experience because you know they moved the device or they snapped it or um, or changed it to a fill view. Um, when you're fill in the fill state, your game should be playable and should simply just adjust. Um, the fill state is isn't um, much different than your full view. So um, say you're snapping from uh, a, a full screen to a, uh, to a fill view, it shouldn't look much different to the players. It should uh, really keep a, a similar look and feel. Um, when it comes to the snap view though, this is where you're gonna have to really scale the game. Um, if you're gonna make your game playable in snap view, um, you're gonna have to you're going to have to deal with a, a few different things. Um, first of all, you're in a lot tighter um, real estate when it comes to um, display, and also where you're going to put your um, user interaction, say like commands uh, and stuff like that. You might have to actually cut those back in order to make it uh, to look properly. You don't want to have it snap and then have a bunch of little icons all over the place, really cluttering it up and, and making it look um, unwieldy. So, um, with a snap view, um, we'll get into this in, in, in the next few slides, but snap view is really good with, um, for players that like to do multitasking. For instance, um, you might want to like, you know, uh, be reading, I don't know, or, or watching a video or something and playing a, a small, simple card game or something in, in snap view. Uh, these things really come in handy for users that like to multitask. It's a, it's a great feature, and if you can find a way to make your game playable in Snap View, I definitely suggest it. Alright, um, let's go ahead and move on to Snap View. I'm going to show you, um, a, a, a for instance here, this is the game called Cannonball. It's being uh, snapped here, and as you can see, it's still playable, but all the elements have been resized to fit on the smaller screen. So it, it, the game's still the same game, it's still the same functionality, it's just been, you know, minimalized to fit on the smaller screen. So that's a great example of uh, how to make a playable uh, snap view game. If we go ahead here in the slides, um, I have an example from Cut the Rope where it's not playable. So what they've done is they basically said, um, if you're in snap view, you can't continue the game. Um, but we're going to give you a little bit of feedback. 
So in this case, they've got a screenshot of, of the current level. They've got uh, what, um, uh, what uh, level you're on um, overall. And then they have a button here that says continue. So if the, the user wanted to, they could cl click continue. It's going to unsnap and it's going to go right back into the game. So that's a good way to implement snap if you don't want the player to uh, to be able to continue playing, or it's not it's not feasible for the player to be able to continue playing. It's, a, it's just a good idea, just to pause it and give them the ability to continue when they see fit. So that's uh that's pretty much it for snap view. So um, let's move on to something else. Um, let's talk about accessibility. Now, um, a lot of times when you're building video games you can really incorporate things for people that have a wide range of abilities and disabilities. So if you're building your game, try to reimagine it as from the point of view uh, of a person with disabilities. Uh, how can we accommodate those players and allow them to have uh, a fun experience in our game as well? Um, adding features for accessibility can make games better for everyone. Um, accessibility features are really easy to, uh, to set up and if you're going to do it, um, start off early in the design process. Um, try to think about this right from the very beginning. How can I design the game so that it's, um, it's accessible to everyone? So um, let's go through here. I'm going to point out a couple of uh, key design points. Um, so if you're designing for someone with visual impairments, um, Blind or very visually impaired users uh, use screen readers a lot to help um, them navigate. So when you're developing your, your model for your game UI, um, think about how is it going to work with a screen reader. Um, you know, uh, your games must be, you must label these, um, these UI elements properly, like with a name, with a role, a description, a state, position, because when the screen reader goes through, these are the things it's going to be looking for, and it's the feedback that they're going to get. So make sure when you, you do um, build these UI elements that you go through and make sure they're named properly and they have all the information that they need. Um, it's important to consider what your UI will look like with uh, system-wide accessibility options on um, the ease of access uh, settings. Are enabled. Um, everything's going to be bigger or maybe a high contrast mode. So you definitely want to think um, how is this going to um, affect my game and what can I do to uh, make it work. <clears throat> um, designing for keyboard accessibility and alternative uh, inputs. Um, keyboard is critical for users using a screen reader um, and for users who have alternative uh, input mechanisms. Um, such as switch controllers or eye trackers. Uh, make sure that all the UI elements uh, can be navigated with the tab and arrow keys. This is really important. It, um, it, it's going to allow them to get through your system without struggling to, you know, to uh, find the proper keyboards um, controls. Um, make sure you make all your commands and controls accessible with keyboard shortcuts. Um, this is uh, very important for people that have uh, keyboard accessibility and also uh, inputs. Um, for example, in Cannonball, the platforms can be turned with uh, the arrow key, allowing the gameplay to be entirely playable with the keyboard input itself. So you don't even necessarily need any other input except for the keyboard. Okay, designing for auditory impairments. Um, if your game makes uses of audio cues, or speech to convey information that is necessary for the gamers, um, make sure you include some sort of subtitles. Um, this, is, this is very important for deaf or hard, hard of hearing users. Um, you want to make sure that they, they're getting uh, all the, the, the um, simple audio cues and speech uh, as well. Um, there should also be uh, visual substitutes for audio um, elements. Um, say like you know if you, if the mood of the game depends on the sound, uh, have some visual cues in there as well that that relate that mood. Don't rely solely on audio to develop the mood. Um, this goes back to great game design development. You you really need to balance everything. It shouldn't just be audio. It shouldn't just be lighting. It should be a mixture of the two. So make sure you have different ways um, of showing that. Um, if you have multiple um, different sounds playing at once. Um, have an effects and dialogue box pop up and provide separate volume controls for each, um, say, speech, music, 
um, stuff like that. So the players can really uh, change that, and it'll help with their comprehension. All right, uh, designing uh, for the cognitive impaired. Um, gameplay should allow for a wide range of difficulty levels and game speeds. Um, you want to set this up so that everyone can enjoy your game. Um, could your game be played by someone who's learning to read? That's a great question to ask yourself. You know, don't make it so complicated that that the average user and people with cognitive impairments can't pick it up and, and, and start playing uh, right off the bat. Um, one easy way to do that um, would be to like say offer a sandbox or a free play mode that has like no time constrictions on it um, and and allows the users to really you know enjoy it without having constraints. So uh, that's a good way of, uh, of dealing with um, users that may have the con uh, cognitive impairments. Um, that's a simple way. Okay, so um, that's uh, pretty much it. Let's uh, wrap it up. Um, Windows 8, again, it, this is a really uh, beautiful platform to develop your games for. It's really easy, um, it's very intuitive, uh, the UI um, structure that the Windows 8 uh, principles relies on, it's, it's really nice because it removes the clutter, um, which is great for us game developers. We don't want a bunch of options all over the screen. We want you focusing on our game. Um, these key features, uh, if you go through them, they're going to help you expand uh, your game, and you're going to really be able to use uh, what we've talked about here to, to make your game stand out in the marketplace. So uh, make sure you follow the advice that uh, we've given you and uh, take a look at all the, um, the guidelines and principles that are available to you when you're developing for uh, Windows 8. And uh, I can't wait to see your games in the uh, store. Thanks for watching, everyone, and uh, we'll take a quick uh, break, and we'll be right back. Thank you.